in the well, there's a book called um, the Book of Heroic Failures. Okay. Okay. There's there's this true story in it. In 1978, British firefighters went on a strike, and British soldiers were temporarily required to take charge of firefighters' work. And on January 14th of that year, an elderly woman in South London called for help because her cat had climbed up a tree and wasn't able to come down. Okay, that happens, right? And the army personnel arrived quickly and rescued the cat. And the lady was so grateful. So she invited the heroes. Hey, the heroes in, who saved the cat. OK, come inside, have an afternoon tea. OK, yeah. You know the British afternoon tea is really sumptu sumptuous, right? <laughs> and after having the afternoon tea, as um, the soldiers were leaving in a happy mood, and they were waving goodbye to the woman, and they were drive backing their car out of the driveway, the car ran over the cat and killed it. Well, life is like that. After a moment of success, failure may immediately follow. And completely erasing the past successful experience and driving people into the abyss of discouragement and depression. And even after a long time, although this memory of past failure gradually fades, but the trauma left behind continues to haunt us, making it difficult to find the courage to start again. In particular, if it is related to people who are close to you, the feeling of guilt and the breakdown of the relationship may become a lifelong regret. I don't know if anyone has ever had regret with um, your parents or siblings or some close friends, yeah? F every day. <laughs> wow. OK. You need to repent. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Well, actually, the Bible is full of examples of real imperfect people who failed. And one of the most famous failure in the Bible is, guess who? The Apostle Peter. Do you remember how Peter had failed Jesus? Yeah? He denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed, right? Remember that? So how was Peter able to put behind all these regrets and discouragement and get back up on his feet and eventually became a pillar of the church. Do you know the Catholic Church always say, Apostle Peter was their first pope. Peter was definitely the, um, well, the head of the first church in history. So today we are going to look at John chapter 21, where Peter met Jesus after Jesus' resurrection. And actually, it, um, it might happen on this very day, 2,000 years ago, you know? It's, um, now, today is two weeks after Jesus' resurrection, right? And it's around this time after Jesus' resurrection that Peter met Jesus again. So we will see how Jesus helped Peter to get back on his feet. So we will look at this passage um, verses 14 to verses 14 to 19, but we will also look at verses uh, 1 and 2. Let's read together. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples of, by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and Two others of his disciples were together. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Okay, well, let's um, pause here. Um, let me fast forward. 
Okay, yeah, we are going to look at the scriptures in three parts. First, it's revealed again. Verse 14 tells us that this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples. Okay, so when were the first and second time? The first time was in John chapter 20 when Jesus appeared to his disciples in a house in Jerusalem on the night of his resurrection. Okay, and so on that evening, Jesus suddenly, well, it's the scripture says that they were in a closed room, okay? Um, no fries can get in and out, okay? But Jesus suddenly appeared in the middle of the room. Wow, <laughs> that's scary. But, and, and then Jesus showed them, okay? And at that time, Thomas was not there, so he doubted. And later he said to the others, well, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And so after one week, Jesus appeared again in the house, eight days later, actually it's one week, as recorded in John 20 again. Yep. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. Okay, no fries can get in and out not even mosquito, okay? And Thomas was with them this time, and then Jesus suddenly appeared again. Wow, so scared. And, and then Jesus told them, well, told Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand, and put out your hand and put it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus was showing them he was not a ghost. Although he could appear suddenly out of nowhere and then disappear, but he was not a ghost. So that was the two times. Jesus wanted to re reaffirm to the disciples that he had risen and he was living and he is living now. Amen? Yeah. And then... Um, actually, Jesus made an appointment to see the disciples in Galilee. Um, in Matthew 26 and 28, um, before the crucifixion, Jesus already told them, after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then after the resurrection, um, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, well, actually the angel, angel at the tomb, told the disciples or told the woman, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Okay, so Jesus made an appointment with the disciples to meet up with them in Galilee. That's why in John 21, we see Peter and other disciples in Galilee. But why Galilee? First of all, it's their home. Remember where did they come from? Galilee. They were originally from there. It's their hometown. And second, being in this familiar place must have brought back many memories of the disciples. They would remember one day three years ago by the seaside in this area, Jesus was preaching to the crowd, 2,000, 3,000 people. When they heard his preaching, their hearts were burning. Then Jesus called Peter, come, follow me, and called several others to follow him. Now that they have experienced life and death with the Lord, they have witnessed the Lord's resurrection and now return to this same old place their understanding of the Lord is completely different from what it was back then. After they had followed Jesus and seen the world in the past three years, they were no longer naive fishermen, but they had a deeper understanding of the world and their own fragility. And in particular, 
Peter, when Jesus told his disciples after the Last Supper that he would be taken up to be executed, Jesus said loudly, You die, I die. Okay, that's what this passage um, in Matthew essentially tells us. Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. And, G and Peter said, Although they all, that means other disciples, they all may fall away because of you. I will never fall away. And then Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, whoop, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, Even if I'm, even if I might die with you, I will not deny you. Okay. <laughs> and all the other disciples said the same. And well, there's an ancient Chinese saying. Um, it goes like this: Everyone is destined to die. It may be heavier than the mountain, or it may be lighter than a feather. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So everyone will die one day, but the purpose of one's death makes a difference. Remember in the Marvel movie, the Avenger 4, Endgame. Anyone watch that? Tony Stark, the Iron Man, died heroically. That's a death heavier than the mountain. It's an honorable sacrifice. And ancient Romans and Jews, they also had similar ideas. Everyone has to die one day. The most important is to die an honorable death. So that's what's what Peter had in mind, honorable death. But later, you know, we all know what happened. When Jesus was uh, arrested, Peter followed behind Jesus in secret, not daring to let anyone recognize him. And, and then a servant girl, you, you can imagine a young girl, a teenage girl um, who is a servant, okay, came up to me. Oh, aren't you also one of his disciples? And Peter denied once. And then twice, another servant girl went to him and he denied again. And the third time, he even swore and cursed. I do not know the man or otherwise Thor is going to put a lightning on me. Well, he didn't exactly say that, but that's the idea. He thought he was strong and not afraid of death, but in the end, it turned out that he was just an ordinary person who feared death, just like everybody else. And what was even more shameful was that he was so frightened that he denied Jesus, not because he was surrounded by soldiers or the Pharisees, but a small fry, like a servant girl and, the, and some ordinary bystanders. He gave up so easily his self-esteem and self-confidence vanish completely, went down the drain. The very moment when the rooster crowed. Then the resurrection of Jesus was actually a slap on Peter's face because Jesus already told the disciples, Jesus already told Peter that he would be resurrected after being crucified. Peter realized he didn't have the faith to believe it and turned his back on Jesus. So after seeing Jesus, Peter must be doubting whether he was still worthy to follow Jesus anymore. So when Jesus appeared the first two times, we are quite certain that Peter also um, Peter also saw the resurrected Lord those two times because um, the, the Bible says um, only Thomas was not there for the first time and the other disciples were there. Yet, John did not record Peter's reaction. Now do you know what Peter is like normally? 
Normally, he would be the first person to speak out and make some shocking remarks. According to his personality, okay, just imagine uh, if I'm Peter, as soon as he saw the resurrected law, he would have said, Lord, it is great you have come back. Please restore the kingdom of Israel now, and I will lead the army and fight. That would be um, what Peter have said. Or the online gamers may say, Lord, raise up the, un the dead and lead form an undead army <laughs> and start a revolution. <laughs> nah. <laughs> well, um, actually, the Bible says um, resurrection happens, right? Okay? So that's totally imaginable. But in the two appearances of Jesus after the resurrection, Peter was surprisingly silent. None, not a word, not even a word. So we see that he must have hit rock bottom and didn't know how to face the Lord. Now, as a matter of fact, we are all like Peter. When we feel that we have failed someone and we have to face that person, we will behave differently than usual and we would act quite unnaturally. You will have that experience. Now, even if the other person no longer mind, there is a f feeling of guilt accusing us in our heart, giving us this hard feeling or if we are the one who have been wronged, we may be eager to confront the person who wronged us as soon as we see him or her. We may find our relationships damaged beyond repair. If it happens at work, well, that may be okay. Yeah, just get another job maybe. Well, or after all, we are just working together for the money. So yeah, let's put on a mask and continue. You don't need to get too emotionally involved. But if it is between brothers and sisters in church, then it will be more hurtful because we have feelings for each other. But the most hurt is between family members, parents and children, husband and wives. The breakdown of the relationship is very profound. Now, Peter had followed Jesus for three years, going in and out together, eating together, sleeping under one roof together, and sharing the joys and the sorrows. The relationship had become like a family, so the guilt and pain in his heart were more profound. I used to make um, this kind of mistake. I remember when my son was a kid, around seven or eight years old. He would, he sometimes, when he walked, um, he would trip and fall flat on his face. When that happened, I used to just in my reaction, okay, hey, watch your step, okay. Yeah, of course I was worried, but then then I couldn't help. Watch your step. Now, well, he didn't want to fall, right? He already felt very bad uh, when he fell down and he had to be blamed by me. So he was very unhappy. Then I would feel bad for the rest of the day. And my wife, yeah, she later would, said, would, would say to me, well, it was already very hard for him when he fell down. Wouldn't it be even worse if you blame him you should comfort him. So, um, yeah, the next time I, when he fell again, I no longer, well, I control myself, okay? Take a deep breath. And then I say, oh, that's okay, are you hurt? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Jesus reacted naturally like us, he might have caught Peter and scolded him as soon as he saw Peter. Peter, didn't you say you would die for me? with me. Now you know your problem. Do you dare to be so puffed up again anymore? But Jesus did not do this. He gave Peter time and space to sort things out. 
and waited until this third time. Okay, the first and second time, Jesus did not talk directly one to one to Peter. The third time, he came to talk to Peter. And th at this time, Peter was waiting to see to meet the Lord with the other disciples by the sea. And naturally, they all needed food. So they returned to their old job. Re remember what their old job is? Yeah, fishermen. Um, but the scriptures tells us that they had been trying to catch fish all night, but they couldn't catch anything. Something wrong with them, right? They were professional fishermen, but they couldn't catch anything. They were not even able to do what they were supposed to be good at. It's conceivable that Peter felt hopeless, no way out. Not even his, well, even his old job abandoned him. Then Jesus came. And just as Jesus had done three years ago, Jesus told them where to cast their net. And they did as he said. And then what happened? The nets were filled with fish. It was like bringing Peter back to three years ago when Jesus first called Peter to follow him. So Peter found the courage to rush over to see Jesus face to face. And then Jesus spoke to Peter to build him up again, to edify him again. He asked Peter three questions. Well, the three questions, we always, we always think the three questions were the same, but actually they were different. Jesus first asked Peter, Simon, son of John. Well, let's read together. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. What exactly was Jesus asking Peter to compare his love with? Was he referring to the net filled with fish? Okay, whether Peter loved him more than material life? Maybe, but Peter had just discovered that he, had, that he could accomplish nothing, not even in his profession without the guidance of the Lord. So he already knows material life in this world is not reliable. A better interpretation of the text is that this, okay, can we have the scripture back? Yep, this, okay, actually refers to these people, these other disciples. Remember, um, on the night when Jesus was delivered to be crucified, Peter denied Jesus three times, but there was one disciple who followed Jesus to the cross. Remember who that was? Yeah, the apostle John. And John was there by the seaside catching fish together with Peter, okay, and several others. So in comparison, Jesus asking, well, Peter, you said, you were the first one who said, you would never leave me. Now, John was the one who followed me to the cross to the end. Now, Peter, do you still think you love me more than the others, including John? So, Peter would know that, objectively speaking, his love for Jesus was not deeper than others. Peter also realized that he had made a mistake. He fell on that night when the Lord was arrested. He felt that his love for Jesus was not deep enough. So when he answered Jesus, he said, Lord, yes, you know that I, the word, Greek word there is phileo. Okay, I have put in the brackets. When Jesus asked him, do you love me? Is the word akapao. You know that word, agape. Okay, agape is a Greek word 
that means love. That's a noun. Here, agapao is the verb, which means to love sacrificially. And the other Greek word, phileo, also means love. Well, some, model, some modern um, Bible scholars think that, well, there's really no distinction between the two Greek words, um, agapao and phileo. Um, they both express the idea of love. Um, so they are interchangeable. But I have done some research with Bible software, and I check on the usage of these two different words for love. And my conclusion is that I agree with the traditional understanding of the two words. Agapao and Phileo had different expressions of love. Agapao is the highest level of love, selfless, altruistic, and unconditional love. Phileo is more on the feeling of joy, the feeling of brotherhood. Such as um, John 3.16, For God so loved Agapao, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ's death on the cross to redeem the world showed God's sacrificial love and his choice. Love, this sacrificial love is a choice for the world. But phileo is more focused on emotional expression. Um, in Chinese, it's more like it's closer to like or cherish or brotherly feeling. So some of the Bible verses that use phileo, including John 5.20, the father loves the son is phileo. Or John 12, people love phileo, their own lives which means to love and cherish. Now, Peter knew that he cherished Jesus as a friend, but his love for Jesus was far from the agapao love to even lay down his life for Jesus because he denied Jesus three times. So he answered Jesus' question with phileo. Okay, some of you may know some Japanese, right? Uh, yeah, um, you know in the Japanese um, manga or anime. <laughs> okay, when the, when, when, the, when the guys and the girls say, uh, I love you, what do they say? Aishideru. No. Actually, if the guy say Aishideru to the girl, the girl will say, oh, that's too serious. That's too much a burden. Usually they will say, Suki des. Dai suki. <laughs> that means I like you very much. Okay, but they will understand it as love. Okay. But aishi de, that means the really serious, heavy, heavy duty love is reserved. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. Well, would people hear the difference if you use two different words, phileo and agapao? You bet. If your wife asks you, do you agap agapao me? And you, you they answer her, oh, I phileo you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's different. That's different. <clears throat> now notice, Jesus' response was not, well, Peter, you don't love me enough. Wait until you love me more, then come back. Jesus did not rebuke Peter, but instead, Jesus commissioned Peter with this command, feed my lambs. That's a command. Okay. Feed my lambs. That's very important responsibility. Not easily given. But Jesus gave this responsibility to Peter, who failed him three times. Okay? And not only once, as we will see in the following verses, two times, and then again, 
three times. Th this are uh, the three commissionings of Jesus. Okay, ranges from little lambs to big old sheep, from new believers to long time believers, from children to those advanced in age, all entrust to Peter to take care of. And Jesus did not force Peter to reach the state of agapao, sacrificial love, before entrusting him. Now let's continue the passage 16. Let's read together. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Okay, now the second time Jesus did not ask Peter to compare with others. Just look into your heart. Do you love me? Okay, and Peter gave the same answer. But the Lord still commissioned him, tend my sheep. And the third time, okay, let's read. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now notice, when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me for the third time, what word did he use? Do you phileo me? The scripture says, Peter was grieved. Well, perhaps Jesus three times asking him what appeared to be the same question reminded Peter of his three times denying Jesus the night when Jesus was delivered to, crucif to be crucified. But now Jesus used this phileo to ask him, okay, Lord, are you doubting me? Not that I was not even worthy of phileo, love to you. It's like lower, lowering the standard, okay? Lord, you know that I love you. Well, Peter is really broken down now. Okay, he, need, he comes to tears. Okay, he answered the Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He was get, getting desperate. He honestly felt, okay, his feeling was that, yeah, Lord, I feel I owe you. But you know everything. Okay, um, he came to realize he really did not know much about himself. Only the Lord Jesus knew everything. And Jesus knew Peter better than Peter himself. So in this simple conversation, Jesus guided Peter to discover and face his own shortcoming, to face his own weaknesses and his own shame. Yet Jesus was still willing to entrust Peter with such important task, rather than relegating him to the sidelines. Okay, yeah, Peter, you are not qualified. Go and sit on the side and wait for the others to, you know, play, the, play in the court. No, he did not do that. Jesus entrusted Peter. So <clears throat> let's get to the last two verses, 18 and 19. Um, yep. Then Jesus called Peter again, once again and again. Now let's read. Okay, let's read together. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now Jesus said to him, well, you were, well, essentially what, what was Jesus saying to Peter? Yeah, Jesus, um, Peter, yeah, when you are young, you would be free to go anywhere. But um, when you are old, sorry, you are going to, going to be caught and um, 
bound up and deliver to be executed. You will die as a prisoner. That's what Jesus was telling Peter. Well, what? How would Peter feel? Okay. Well, how would you feel if a fortune teller tell you, "Yeah, you are going to um, die a cruel death one day." Well, you know fortune tellers cannot be trusted, right? But you will still feel bad, right? <laughs> you would still remember from time to time. I'm, am I going to die a cruel death one day? <laughs> and here, Jesus, Jesus, Peter knew that Jesus one hundred percent true in his word, because Jesus said, "I would die and then resurrect," and Jesus died. And resurrected, as he said. So G- Peter would know Jesus when Jesus told him this, it will happen. So what what do you think G- P- Peter would think? Would it be a heavy burden for him? Actually, no. Peter would be excited. Huh? Why? Okay. Um, you know the gladiators. Um, can we show the picture? Oop. Yep, you know the gladiators, right? In the Romans' time, they fight to the death in front of Caesar in the arena to win a glorious um, crown. Okay, that's their honor. And remember what Peter said on the night. Um, Before Jesus was caught, what did Peter said? We just read. Um, Peter said, "Even if, well, essentially, Peter said, 'You die, I die.' Right? That's what he said. Now Jesus actually is giving Peter another chance to fulfill his words. He is giving Peter another chance." This time, not to deny Jesus again, but to follow Jesus to his death. Okay, in the church tradition, um, Peter was caught and then taken to the cross. And Peter actually said, "Well, I'm not worthy to be nailed to the cross the same manner as my Lord." So, what did Peter request? Yeah, Peter requests to be crucified upside down. That's the honor for Peter. And Peter, hearing that, he would not feel depressed. He would feel lift up, honored, because he has a- another chance in the future to show his love for Jesus. And Jesus is telling him, "Okay, now you your love is still filial, but in the future your love for me will be agapao." Wow, so reaffirming actually. And then at the end, Jesus said to Peter, "Follow me." The same words once again from three years ago, when Jesus called Peter. So comforting, so encouraging. Peter was doubting. Oh, am I st- worthy to follow Jesus anymore? Jesus is telling him, "Follow me." So, for conclusion, everyone has the experience of failing other people. Now, today we have three aspects. If you are The one whom someone had failed you, you are in the same shoe as Jesus. Learn from Jesus. Jesus calls us to learn from Him, to be meek and lowly in heart like Him. When we feel that we have been failed by someone else, betrayed by our close ones, our natural reaction is to blame, to reject, or not trusting that person anymore. But look at Jesus' way of dealing with someone who failed him. Jesus, although he had the right to get even, he chose to give Peter 
enough time and space to sort things out. He understands Peter's limitations, and he even entrusted Peter once again. We can choose to do the same. It's a choice. It's a choice. <laughs> and second, if you are the one who had failed others, like Peter, learn from Peter. When we know that we have failed someone else in our promise, and we have failed the Lord Jesus in our commitment, we may feel guilty about it. We may want to run away. We may want to stay away from church sometimes. And if this guilt feeling is not dealt with, it will make us feel powerless. It will hinder our growth and prevent us from de developing the gifts and talents God has given us, prevent us from realizing the mission in life that God has given us. So like Peter, we must honestly face and accept our weaknesses and shortcomings and our shame. And our Lord Jesus has, he promised he would accept us if we come back to him. Our Lord wants us to get back up from where we failed, to start over again. And thirdly, if it's a question to ask yourself, are you living a meaningful life? Is it you said all you said a comfortable and stable life all you want in life our generation this age advocates that the most important thing for people to do is to live a long and happy life right unknowing unknowingly our views on life and death has have become numb we no longer care about dignity and worth and worthiness like the ancient people. Today, around the world, we are seeing less people dedicating themselves to missions, less people enrolling for seminaries. Everyone just want to make a good living and live a stable or interesting life. I searched the internet for bucket list. Do you have a bucket list? Okay, now look at the list. Bucket list, okay, swim with dolphins, ride in a hot air balloon, see the northern lights, sleep in the igloo, okay, scuba diving, visit an elephant sanctuary, skydive, and it goes on. And the other list, get a tattoo, kiss in the rain, go well watching. Man, this, most of this stuff, so trivial and so self-indulgent. Okay, now it's not wrong to do any of this, right? I, I think it's great. Um, um, but where are the things that really have an impact in life? Where are the things, especially for Christians, that have impact on God's kingdom? Swimming with dolphins? Do you think that would have an impact in God's kingdom? We really should mourn for the loss of guts to pursue greater things for God. So brothers and sisters, let me give you a challenge. Would you rather live your life in peace and comfort? Now don't get me wrong again. Okay, living in peace and comfort is not wrong, okay? but. Do you have the glory of God in mind? Okay, and take some risk for God. I'm not telling you all to go to the Islamic State in the Middle East and become martyrs, okay? Of course, there are people like Peter who glorify the Lord with their martyrdom. But there are also people like John who after 100 years of old age glorified because they have completed the missions given to them by the Lord and died an old age. Okay. So which life do you prefer to live? Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, you are the risen Lord 
you have proved yourself to be true, truly God in your resurrection, and you have proved your love to us through your sacrifice and through your acceptance of Peter once again and again. Lord, help us. Sometimes we fail others, and sometimes others fail us. Lord, help us to be like you, that we may be meek and lowly in heart and be able to hold our anger, hold our heart feelings back, and try to edify the other person. Or Lord, when we have failed others, give us the courage to face ourselves and face our wrongdoings and face the other person that we may stand up once again and continue to follow you, our Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we know that even if we have failed you, you are willing to accept us if we come back to you. We thank you. And Lord, give us the sense of purpose and mission in this life that let us see clearly what we can do for your kingdom, for your glory in this life of ours that you have given us, that we may live a honorable and meaningful life and follow you to the end and strengthen our hearts and bless our young people here that they have a future ahead in, um, guided by you. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.